Okay, uh, maybe uh, we get started. Uh, people can still roll in. If I'm here early, I always start early. Um, how's everyone doing this morning? Fantastic. Good to hear. Who, uh, who didn't look at the exams since last time? Oh, we have one truthful person, five truthful people. <laughs> it's all in how you ask the question, I guess, right? Who did look at them? Yeah, good number. Fine. So, uh, good. So, I mean, I will make the, the case that I think it's important that, uh, that you do that just because I think it really is uh, being able to perform well on the exams and especially on the first exam to put you in the right position on the starting grid for the remainder, I think is uh, an important condition. So, so think about those as you're doing the assignments for this class. Um, think about how maybe slightly different these exams are from the assignments. You notice that uh, they are multi point questions. Getting the first one wrong doesn't mean you get the second one wrong. If you get the, the working right, I think that's fine, and the, that's why we have graders rather than multiple choice. You'll see that we morphed from doing multiple choice questions maybe four years ago to only doing these uh, written calculations. That's the way it'll be for you as well. Um, and they are graded quite uh, carefully. Um, the other thing that you might be interested to do is to look at the prior videos. Um, and so I was reminded coming in today I was very naughty, actually, in that uh, coming in today, I took a picture while I was driving. And maybe you can see it there. Can <laughs> if I. Is that me playing? Or is that someone's phone? Someone's phone. Okay. All right. I won't. So if you look at this today, my naught my uh, probably illegal activities. I'd get fired if I worked at Chevron, for sure. They'll fire you if they see you using a cell phone in a car, apparently. Is a, uh, this is uh, Kevin Witt, actually. He's a former graduate of the Environmental Systems Engineering Program from I don't know, 15 years ago, I'm guessing. Um, and he has a fly in a balloon service, uh, which happens to be here. You'll notice that one of the questions on the exams in a past year was about a balloon. You might also notice if you go to the uh, classes for that year that there was some discussion in class about balloons and how they work. And so often there are things that we talk about in class that end up on the exam. And so there's, there's a connection. It's not just out of the blue. And so uh, I'd say that that might be something that also you want to uh, embed in your mind. So you can go and do those. So think about that when you look at these exams. Um, in terms of what's up on uh, Canvas, I'm still getting used to Canvas. Um, I don't know whether you are more skilled than I. There's probably a good chance that you are. Um, there is an exam question that's live, and so you can, I've taken it twice, and just randomly I got 55 out of 100, and so that's a good omen. I think it's set up the way it's want to be. Uh, the, the assignments will close every Thursday at 11.59, not at 2 o'clock in the morning the next day, as I mentioned, just because it's easier. It tells you exactly on Canvas now when they finish. That wasn't the case with Angel before. Um, and so they will close at midnight, basically, on the Thursday. You will have the material to answer them by, um, by midnight on the previous Friday. So you basically have a a week to, to do them, and as a result of these, it gives you, it doesn't give you the answers, but it will give you the questions which are incorrect. So, again, you can game the system if you so wish. I would encourage you not to do that, but, um, but so apparently I only got 10 out of uh, 100 this time. It will take the highest of three, three attempts, and so that's the deal. So these are live. They'll be due not tomorrow at midnight, but a week tomorrow at midnight. Uh, for the first one. So you have that. Uh, what else? The other things um, that I put on here uh, are that the exams are uploaded. You've already got some of them. I guess there are now links for syllabus to be able to go both to um, the course syllabus, which is online. I think it opens up a separate window. And I think all these, the course resources page, and on that course resources page, you'll be able to see the material. Guys, uh, now you've been recognized. Uh, you can have me in stereo. I'll give you a, a you lucky people. Applause, I don't think you need that. And so you'll see that's up there. 
This I didn't realize that the uh, Irish commentator that was a bit blue last time. I apologize for that. I didn't realize quite that. I didn't listen to the audio before, so I excised that. And actually, when I uploaded this to uh, YouTube last time, I got a copyright complaint, just like this, or a claim. And it was from the IOC for the stuff on the, the canoeing. So if you're here last time, that stuff isn't in the front part of this because um, I had to excise it and then upload it again. So those are the things that I can think of from coming from last time. Um, yeah, no, I can't think of anything else. Any questions from last time of what we might want to, uh, to deal with before we kind of embark on our exciting and continuing uh, journey today? No? Everyone's shy? So uh, the first material we had playing was uh, just a program that was on PBS last night about the Adirondacks. Um, I, the snippets that you'd have seen would have included things about fluid mechanics. Um, fluids are all around us, of course. Um, we had whitewater kayaking uh, or whitewater rafting, obviously free surface flows, uh, drag coefficients, uh, buoyancy. We had the 90 mile uh, Adirondack Classic, which runs every weekend after Labor Day. So I guess in two weeks time from now, three weeks time from now, with a, a three day 90 mile canoe course uh, with portages in between. Uh, we had skiing, uh, sliding, you know, the, the rate at which you go down a mountain is gravity pulling you down and friction beneath your feet and air drag on you slowing you down are the forces that are acting on you. And so those are the main components that um, control uh, our behavior in fluid mechanics. Um, so what I want to do today is uh, just embark on our normal uh, activities. And I guess I'm going to start right here. I'm going to make this full screen and get rid of this. I'm going to get rid of this. So, just to make the case that uh, fluids are all around us uh, and are important to our lives, period, uh, we can look at a variety of systems. Uh, if you woke up, when, before I went to bed last night at 10 o'clock, I got notification that in the, uh, the Apennines in central Italy, there was a, a magnitude 6.2, 6.4, they thought then, 6.2 now earthquake that's so far uh, taken a number of lives, unfortunately. Um, and so... Plate tectonics is driven by convection of a fluid underneath a very thin crust, which may be 50 kilometers on the surface of the Earth. Uh, and those convection cells drive solid plates together and ultimately result, can result in the release of that energy either aseismically or seismically. Um, Louisiana got 20 inches, no, two feet of rain over a couple of days, and you know that people are still digging out from that. Uh, so the atmospheric uh, circulation system is also a big fluid mechanic system as well, as is uh, the mantle beneath the, um, uh, the crust with subduction zones, um, creative uh, plate margins where we make crusts such as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and such as the Apennines in, in Italy is actually a stalled subduction zone uh, that actually forms the spine of, of Italy. Uh, tsunamis from uh, 2004, the famous Indonesian Boxing Day tsunami. Um, the fallout from the Deepwater Horizon just been made into a, a movie. Certainly the circulation of uh, the uh, discharged crude oil on the base of, uh, from the base of the Gulf uh, that floated to the surface was circulated by ocean circulation in the Gulf. Uh, ice sheets are very slow-moving fluids uh, that barely, barely perceptibly move, but basically follow the same rules of motion as, as uh, other fluids. And of course, the uh, explosive eruption of Mount St. Helens before many, most of you were born in May the 18th, 1980, uh, was an overpressure by magma coming up from the base of the... Uh, Base, base of the crust building up until it uh, overpowered the, the, the weight of, of rock sitting on top of it. In engineered systems, uh, deep water horizon, uh, an example not only of uh, fluid mechanics, but also one of the, the care and the sacred trust that is extended to all engineers, many of whom you will be, many of you will be those uh, one of these days. Uh, so deep water horizon, um, 
combustion in uh, internal combustion engines. Every time you fly, still, the velocities of planes are defined by pitot tubes, which use fluid mechanics principles to be able to define what velocity that you're going at. You can use GPS as well, but local velocities are use uh, uh, pitot tubes. Wave energy with articulated snakes that articulate in response to waves, um, and that articulation could be used to drive uh, engines. High school example of Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which was really an example of fluid mechanics, a constant wind velocity blowing across the uh, section of this bridge, put it in motion. The resonant frequency happened to be the same frequency that the forcing frequency of the wind caused, and it ultimately pulled itself together in the 1950s. Um, the pattern of um, uh, natural gas pipelines in the U.S. feeding from the Gulf originally, but getting uh, gas up to the northeast where all the population lives, and storing it in northern Pennsylvania in deep uh, salt caverns where it can be used to quickly get it to New York City when everyone turns their stoves on at uh, 7 o'clock in the morning. And of course, flow and pores media for um, geothermal energy and for natural gas uh, recovery in Marcellus is something, fluids flowing in pores media, which is a subject that certain environmental systems engineers and petroleum engineers and mining engineers to some degree all deal with uh, as a, a kind of a core discipline. In terms of uh, recreation, Fluid mechanics, they don't use it now, but I think it, maybe it was the 2000 Olympics in uh, Sydney. They had these full body suits. These, this isn't a wetsuit for diving, but a full body suit that used to, was used to actually reduce drag in some way. Uh, the America's Cup, the big innovation for the uh, Australians or the New Zealanders, when they, uh, Austra Australians, when they took the New Zealand, uh, the, the America's Cup, was this shrouded keel that they used, which had these fins on it, which reduced drag and made boats faster. Of course, the sail systems in boats is something that relates to uh, fluid flow. Whitewater boating, uh, surfing waves in uh, surfing West Virginia, as they would say. It's a balance between sitting on the front of a wave, using gravity to push you down the wave, and the flow of the water underneath you to push you downstream. The balance of those is uh, what keeps you in place, so you can stay in place. Spin of a baseball, why golf balls are dimpled so they go further. Uh, snowboarding or skiing is a balance between forces that are exerted on a body. And of course, throwing a football and spinning it. Why we spin it is because uh, it gives it stability, not least of which is because it makes sure that the laces, which would have the largest drag as it goes, aren't always on the same part of the ball as it goes through. It would drag more and it would tend to turn to one side. But if you spin it, you actually have that ex excess drag rotated around the, um, uh, around the individual portions of the football. And so it tends to go straighter, among other, other reasons. So that's kind of a preamble as to why we might be interested in this for, for all kinds of, of reasons. Our way of doing the class is, if you've looked at any previous materials, is we'll have this kind of problem statement at the beginning, and we'll try and work through it. And I'll tend not to use these overheads as much as to talk and to scribble down some, some individual things. And so my guess is that today we will get about this far, and that will be our, our attempt to go through this. We'd like to talk about the difference between fluids, liquids, and gases. This class is called Fluids Mechanics, and it, of course, includes liquids, gases, and not really solids, but it could do. Uh, we'll talk about dimensional homogeneity and individual fluid properties. Uh, we'll talk about mass and weight and their differences, uh, ideal gas law, and a little bit about compressibility. So we'll talk really about the, the properties of the fluids that we're, we're dealing with. Um, if we uh, talk first about... You'll grow to love my writing. Fluids, of course, encompass... Um, both liquids and gases, but also if we just stretch it a little bit, <coughs> we can talk about some very specific uh, properties of these uh, individual components. And so, well, we know what a solid is. A solid is 
what my head's made of. We know what liquids are. Liquids fill up the space into which they are put, but they leave a, uh, a head space. And of course, gases occupy fully the space into which they are placed. So we know exactly what they are. Some components, like water or CO2, for instance, can exist in all of these states, depending on where they are on um, a phase diagram. And the properties that maybe are of interest to us are such things as we could call density, which we'll call rho, not p, has an inclined component, uh, viscosity, I'll have to get used to writing on this pad again, which we'll call mu, and compressibility, or we'll call it modulus, just because, which we'll call E, it's up here, EV. So this is modulus, kind of compressibility. This is viscosity, and in the ideal the gas law, we'll come back to these just to identify what these are. And so solids are materials that if you add a force to it, it will deform, but it won't keep on deforming. And so um, that's what their characteristics. Liquids are fluid, uh, components that if you push a force on it, a shear force on the top of it, it will move at a constant velocity. And so as both of these are fluids, That's one characteristic of, of what these are. So in terms of viscosity, um, viscosity of gases are very low. Viscosities of liquids are moderate, I guess. And viscosity of solids, such as ice, are high. And so they, they differ in those characteristics. Density, density of most solids, well, rocks are something like 2,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Water, as you know, is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So density of solids are also high. Densities of liquids are in the middle, modest. And the densities of gases are, are low. And so they, they, they differ in, in, in that regard. If we look at modulus, modulus is the resistance to deformation. So if you put a, try and deform these boxes, a container with a gas in it, say a balloon, and you try and deform it, then gases are relatively low modulus. They deform easily, highly compressible. So we could also like write compressibility. Which is often given the term beta, if you're a petroleum engineer, which is also the same as one over modulus, it's the reciprocal. So some people think in terms of compressibility, they're uh, the reciprocal of each other. So the modulus of a gas is low. The modulus of a liquid is actually quite high. And the stiffness, if you like, or modulus of solid is also. You kind of have a feel for these things. So many of these things can exist in um, multiple states, depending on the pressure and temperature conditions. Uh, in fact, all, all matter can, right? All, all matter will melt so long as the, the, the pressure is, temperature is high enough. If we look at where we are now, we're sitting in this room, we're probably about 20 degrees centigrade. Uh, so we know that uh, 20 degrees C is what in terms of Kelvin? So this is zero degrees centigrade, absolute two, plus 273 degrees above absolute zero, 20 degrees for 20 degrees centigrade. So we, we sit here now at about 290 centigrade, 290 Kelvin rather, right here. So this is a, 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 a phase diagram for CO2. So if you look at our current temperature, the pressure we find ourselves is one bar, one atmosphere is one bar. That's what this is given as here. One bar 
is equal to, anyone know? In SI units. I should make the case that we'll use only SI units in this class, no English units. Maybe disappointing for petroleum engineers who the whole discipline is for some reason is in pounds and inches and slugs and feet, but we'll use SI units in this class exclusively in the exams. One bar in SI? Yeah, very good. 101 kPa kilopascals as a pressure. And so we sit here on this diagram here. CO2 at room temperature and room pressure, where we are here, is a gas. If we were to enclose it and increase the pressure, we'd go on a trajectory that would make it a liquid. And if we kept on increasing the pressure, then ultimately it would become a solid. If, go <coughs> if we wanted to make it a solid, then we'd have to reduce the temperature. And if that's the case, we'd go across here. And it would reverse sublimate. It would go directly from a gas to a solid because it wouldn't cross the liquid phase. So depending on our pressure and temperature, we can also figure out exactly where we are in terms of what phase we might be in. And so we can move between any of these phases with these different uh, physical properties attached to them. If we we're a little warmer, if we we're, for instance, 30 degrees centigrade, so that we were actually, uh, this would be 303 Kelvin, and we went up, we'd find out that we went into this particular phase here. And the CO2, if we increase the pressure up to, this is about uh, 7 MPa, 7 megapascals. So in other words, this is a tenth of a megapascal. So 70 times this pressure. Then we'd find out that we were at this critical point of uh, CO2. And then we go from this gas directly into what's called a supercritical fluid. And a supercritical fluid is not important for this class, but it has the density of a liquid. So the density is quite high. But it has the viscosity of a gas, which is quite low. And so if you want to take CO2 that comes out of smokestacks from fossil fuel burning, and you want to put it underground, then the best way to do it is a supercritical CO2. It's going to be that way anyway because the pressure is underground at quite high because high density means that you can get a lot into a small space and low viscosity is that you don't have to use much energy to pump it in. You have to use lots of energy to compress it as it comes out of the smokestack, but you won't have to use much energy to, to push it in. And so those are the characteristic behaviors of, um, of, of fluids, liquids and gases. So, that's kind of a, a quick introduction to, to what we're dealing with. Dimensional homogeneity. And so, we'll deal with lots of equations in this class. You can see some of the ones that we'll, we, we'll talk about down below. One thing that is useful when we talk about the dimensions of quantities, and that is if we're adding quantities together, we can always make the case that the equations that we add together, so we've already gone through this much. All the expressions that we add together, if you're adding apples, you can only add apples to apples, you can't add apples to oranges, you know, to use the, the, the vernacular. And so what we might think about is dimensional homogeneity. And so I'm going to branch off on this. And so where are we? So this, uh, you might have seen this on other videos if you looked at them. 1.2 is where we are in this class. This is fluid properties. Oh, that writing is getting pretty good, don't you think? Can you see this, by the way? I should ask. At the back? Wait. So we could look at some things. So what could we look at? So if we have... Um, This is x and y, so this is x, this is y, this is x0, this is x1, this is y0, this is y1. If we want to define, for instance, the area of this um, plate, then you'll remember that the area is just this.
between these limits of x0, x1, and y0, y1. If we wanted to say, so if we do that integration, not surprisingly, we get x times y between these limits of x0, x1, y1, y0. And if we multiply that out, then we just end up with x1 minus x0 multiplied by y1 minus y0. So pretty elementary stuff. But it demonstrates something to us. The units of area. We all know the units of area have to be in length squared, which in SI units would be m squared. If we wanted to check whether this equation was right, uh, we could check that it, whether it was wrong by checking whether the units on the right-hand side were the same as the units on the left-hand side. If they're not, then we know de facto that it has to be wrong. And so the units on the right-hand side, what we can do is we can ignore this operator, this differential operator. We have units of length here. We have units of length here. And so de facto, this has to be m squared. So it may seem elementary, but it's a useful to be able to do that because you can always check it. So you can do it for integral equations such as this. We talked about the prerequisites for this class, I guess, last um, uh, on Monday. The fact that you probably don't need EMEC or Physics 212, which is altruism magnetism. What you might need is EMEC 212, which is uh, dynamics. But the one equation that you need for this class is going to be something like this, which you should recognize. Newton's second law. It can be a scalar, where it's a force in one direction, an acceleration in one direction. It can be a vector, where there are forces in each of the three directions, and we'll use it in that form with the right-hand rule. I'm not being rude. Um, and we can look at the dimensions of this. And so we can write this in a slightly different way, that it's mass multiplied by a rate of change of velocity with time, which by definition is an acceleration. And so if we wanted to, we could figure out exactly what the magnitudes of a force is. We know that a force is a Newton, um, but the unit system that we'll work in, are there are two unit systems. <coughs> and those are referred to as mass, length, and time. And equivalent to those are force, length, and time. So in the SI system, the units for these will be the masses, of course, in kilograms. The length is in meters. And time is in seconds. Force, length, and time is the same in terms of uh, length and time. But in terms of the forces, the SI standard unit of force is a uh, is a Newton. <clears throat> and so if you wanted to define this equation in terms of force, length, and time, it's pretty easy. This is just going to be Newtons. If you wanted to determine it in mass, length, and time, which is the one that we'll probably um, defer to or associate with, then it's not clear exactly what the forces are, but we can write this in terms of a way that we'd be able to figure it out. So what are going to be the units of, of this particular equation? Well, mass is going to be... Um, so yeah, okay. I shouldn't, this is mass, by the way. Maybe I should write it as uppercase to avoid confusion with meters. And so in terms of uh, mass, this is going to be units of mass. Again, as we said here, we don't care about these operators. We can remove them. And so this is the units of this are just velocity over time. So velocity is in terms of length per unit time. And time is 1 over t. And so de facto, we know that the units of force in SI units have to be mass, length, t minus 2. So 
And so if we have more complicated equations, we can check to see if they're at least not incorrect. We can't necessarily say they're correct. Of course, you could write any equation that has um, units that match in all the terms, but if you choose the equations randomly, they might not be correct. But you can tell if they're incorrect if they don't match in terms of terms. Of course, the one exception to that rule is all of you doing petroleum engineering, where equations are always written that are specific to units. And you have to use inches, you have to use slugs, you have to use whatever, and you get the right answer for those. Those are equations where they are typically not dimensionally homogeneous. We will never, ever use those equations in this class. So we'll, all equations that we'll end up using should be dimensionally homogeneous. What else do we need to do? Um, yeah, I'm not sure you need to do much else. Uh, you can also apply this if you wanted to to um, things like equations that you also might know. And so I'm thinking that maybe you know something like uh, Bernoulli's equation. And so you know Bernoulli's equation says something about the flow of fluids. Again, we'll use this coordinate system. Actually, in this class, we'll always use z as the vertical direction, and x and y in the horizontal plane. And so Bernoulli's equation says something about the fact that if you have a stream that's flowing with a particle of fluid that's flowing in it, then we can always write Bernoulli's equation as a pressure divided by density and gravity. Um, we can always write it as a term that represents the elevation and a term that represents the velocity of that particle, a piece of fluid, v squared divided by 2g. So also in this class, we'll use v equals velocity. And we'll use uppercase v with a line through it, typically equals volume, just as a standard. And Bernoulli's equation says that this, if it's in viscid flow, should be constant. This <coughs> elevation relative to a datum here, datum, datum, is z. So in other words, this here would be uh, z equals zero. Uh, this would be the pressure at this particular point. That's not a mu. This would be the acceleration due to gravity, and this would be the density of the fluid. The reason I mentioned that you know, dynamics should be the precursor to this class is because if you look at this, you can write this expression as F. Just as this. So Bernoulli's expression has two components in it. It has the forces, the static force due to the, 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 the pressure of the water, and it has the static force due to the elevation. But there's a dynamic term, which is this inertial term, that you have to supply energy to the fluid to actually accelerate it. You take a fluid over here, it's static. To move it at some velocity, you have to apply a force to it to be able to get it to accelerate. And that's the, so this is really a term in, in a, a force per unit volume. The units of this uh, term have to be units of length, right? This is length. And so if you look at the individual units that this must make up, you can check whether they uh, satisfy that. We could take any one of them. If we take, um, oh, let's not do that. Let's uh, look at, first of all, pairing these. Which ones do I want to pair? Yes, OK, pair these. What happens if we take these and we combine them? We've said that this has to be the same units as this and this. And so what we could do is we could take this term and divide one by another. So in other words, we can take these two and we can get v squared over 2g. And if we divide by this term, we get p over rho g, 
And if we start canceling terms out, we can get rid of velocities. And we end up with something which is v squared rho over pressure. And we'll find out as we go through this class that this is called uh, an Euler number, E-U-L-E-R. And it's the primary equation that we use to be able to determine the forces that are applied on structures, the pressures that are applied on structures as a function of the velocity of the fluid flowing past it, for example. We know that since this was originally length and this was originally length, dividing length by length has to give us a unitless number. And it's unitless numbers that are useful in this class. We could also do that if we wanted to take these other two components. We could take them all in combination. So if we take, uh, for instance, if we do um, this as v squared over 2g, and we divide through by uh, z, we end up with something which is uh, v squared over 2gz, which we can actually, if we wanted to, all square root, which is just velocity over 2g z square root. And this is called the Froude number, Froude number, which we call fr. <coughs> and this uh, looks at the components of the forces due to gravity, which is due to z, the potential, and the forces due to inertia. And it turns out that this term on the bottom is actually this is a velocity on the top. The units of this have to be a velocity on the bottom. This is actually the velocity of a, a wave in the water, a water wave at the beach. A function of the depth of the water, gravitation acceleration controls the speed of it. And so its importance is it's useful in looking at the, the motion of, of a canoe or a boat in the water. You push a boat through the water, it builds a bow wave. The bigger that bow wave, the harder it is to physically push the boat in the system. And so this indexes the resistance that's present in the water to do that. And so anyway, so the importance of non-dimensional numbers is, is kind of key in that. So there are many quantities that we'll use in this class. We mentioned the fact that they fall into a variety of uh, two main systems. Force length and time and mass length and time. You'll find this uh, table in your book if you've bought it. And as a function of all of these different components, you can figure out exactly what these uh, units are. If you don't know what they are, just like we did for uh, force, you can usually figure it out by writing, for instance, in our case, F equals MA. If you know what mass is and if you know what acceleration is, you can work them out. If you don't know what, for instance, uh, viscosity is, viscosity must be here somewhere. It's kind of a complicated expression. Likewise, when we know that Newton's law of viscosity says that shear stress is equal to viscosity multiplied by a rate of change of velocity with location, we know this has units of length, this has units of length over time, this has <coughs> units of stress, which is our units of force over area. If we know those, then we should be able to calculate what this is. And so that's uh, a technique that we'll get to use. So very important. We'll use dimensional numbers in this class because they are index uh, certain forces. If you've had any uh, fluid mechanics in your previous life, you'll know of, you may know of your Euler number, which is the ratio of pressure to inertial forces. You may know of Froude number, which is the ratio of inertial to gravity forces. And you almost certainly know Reynolds number, which is the ratio of inertial to viscous flow forces, the viscosity of the fluid from stopping us moving. So those will all be uh, important components. The other thing that you see in here is that there's not just mass, length, and time, but there is another quantity. And the other quantity that we saw in the phase diagram would be temperature. And typically, certainly in your textbook, the quantity for temperature is given as uh, theta. 
which is almost always we need to use it in absolute temperatures. Absolute pressures and absolute temperatures are what we would use in defining uh, these behaviors. Okay. What else? Um, whoops, wrong way. It might be worthwhile noting that. I'm just going to go back to this previous, so I guess there's not much space there. Oops. So the other thing uh, that we might note are magnitudes. We've already alluded to it, and you'll already be aware of it. Pressures and temperatures. So if you look at some kind of scale for uh, pressures, absolute pressure equals zero, that's a vacuum. Where we sit here today, we're at atmospheric pressure, which is about equal to 101 kilopascals, 14 point something PSI as you will know. And so this equals zero gauge pressure. And so everything around us is already at this pressure. And so any pressure that we take relative to this starts from zero at what we feel now and goes above that. And so there's a difference between pressure absolute, which would be sitting at 101 point kPa now, and pressure gauge, which begins at this pressure at zero, and then goes up from there. And so when we use things like the ideal gas law, for instance, we have to use absolute pressure. Temperatures have the same deal. This is just a graph. T equals zero Kelvin is absolute. And zero centigrade would be 273 and change Kelvin, which is zero degrees centigrade. So temperature, as we've already alluded to, in here, if this is 20 centigrade, which is usually taken as room temperature, is something like 293K. So you need to do that. And that's important because when we look at the ideal gas law, which relates pressure to density to gas constant times temperature, this is always absolute temperature. And this is always absolute pressure. Uh, we can write it in a variety of ways. We can write it in terms of this gas constant, which is true for a particular uh, gas, which we might call I. Or we could use it for a universal gas constant, which sometimes we write as just by substituting density and molecular mass of the gas molecular weight of the gas, and temperature, again, these are absolute pressures. And so we can always use uh, things in those, those behaviors. Right? So that's a, a refresher. I'm sure you've seen that before. How are we doing? We've got five minutes left. So if we zip down through this, so this is all about dimensional analysis. This is all about making sure your units match up. Uh, this is about individual components. This is about ideal gases. Two things maybe to talk about. One is the ideal gas law, which was implicit within um, uh, the phase diagram that we talked about and how we use that and what it means. And also what moduli, elastic moduli of gases are, the two things that we had on our, our schedule. The first is the ideal gas law. We've just talked about it in terms of what, what these components are. We can use that to be able to calculate the pressures and densities of gases which are related 
as a function of what the gas is, which this term relies on, and whatever, whatever temperature we find ourselves at, which is what this one relies on. So we need to be uh, aware of, of those components. So what we can do is we can look at compression of gases and try and predict exactly what the pressures would be and the, the corresponding densities at those pressures. And we can compress it in two different ways. If you imagine taking a, a bicycle pump, putting your thumb over the end of it and compressing it, isothermally means that you take that bicycle pump, you cover it in styrofoam so there's no temperature change. All of the, no, sorry, that's, that's not the way of it. You leave it open, you allow the wind to blow over it so that any heat that you generate gets whisked away by the wind, and so the temperature of the pump stays exactly the same temperature as you compress it. If that's the case, then the temperature doesn't change. So you can write um, the pressure divided by the density is equal to RT. If the pressure of this pump before you pressurize it is P0, and the pressure after you pump it is P1, and the temperature is not changing, then this term on the right-hand side has to be a constant. If that's the case, then pressure and density the ratio of those two always has to be a constant. So if you know what that behavior is when you first do it, if you compress it to, to a new pressure, you can always calculate what the new density would be, straightforward. But if you do it isentropically, which means that you take your bike pump now, you put your thumb across the top, you cover it in styrofoam so none of the energy can get out of it, now the temperature no longer is constant. All you know is you're keeping all the thermal energy that you generate by compressing it inside, then the ratio is modified by some term. This constant is just the ratio of the specific heats. This is typically about 1.4 of that order of magnitude. And you can also calculate it. So it matters how you do it. It matters if you compress it without changing the temperature or if you compress it without changing the energy within the system. And so you get different results based on that. So be aware of that. Is yeah. that we raise to the power of K? Raise to the power of K. P over rho raised to the power of K. And it's just a number. Specific heats uh, are how much heat a, a material can absorb, basically. And so a specific heat divided by a specific heat, by definition, has to be the same units, right? And so it has to be a dimensionless term. Finally, uh, we made the case about fluids being compressible, not very stiff, and liquids being quite stiff. Surprisingly, Liquids, water has about the same stiffness as concrete. You think that's strange because you squeeze it, it goes out. But actually, if you put it in a container and squeeze it all around, it has basically the same stiffness as concrete. A generic definition of modulus is this. We've said that this is also equal to 1 over compressibility. just by definition. So in the same way that electrical res resistance and electrical conductance are the reciprocal of each other, then compressibility is the reciprocal, the inverse of um, uh, modulus. The units of this are in um, newtons per meter squared. So the units of compressibility have to be in 1 over newtons per meter squared. And by definition, um, the behavior is uh, a pressure change as a result of compressing it. So this is a change in volume divided by the original volume. You could think of it as kind of as a strain. So you take a, a fluid-filled balloon, has initial volume, you change the volume by some amount, what's going to happen? You reduce the volume, and the pressure goes up or down. I think up, right? You'd expect it to go up. So if you reduce the volume, this would be negative. The pressure goes up. The reason for the negative sign is that this term is just a, a positive coefficient, always a positive coefficient. So the reason for the negative sign is only that. You can also, ch since you compress it, you'll change the density because you have a smaller volume which has the same mass of material uh, contained inside it, and so the density has to change. And so what we can do is we want to calculate what the modulus is, at least for a gas, we can take the ideal gas law. 
if we differentiate this with respect to rho, then we end up getting rid of this term and we end up with a constant. So that's this. If we now take this term, so this term here is exactly what this is. If we now take the ideal gas law without differentiating it and just rearrange it in terms of density, so instead of writing it right like this, forget this now, just rearrange it in terms of this term and you end up with this expression. If you now substitute this in here and you do these substitutions, you end up with this term here, which we want, is equal to this term, which we've said is a constant, and is equal to substituting in here, which is just p divided by a constant. That's this term here. It's one over, this one over this. So we end up with this term here. And so we end up with an interesting result. It says that the stiffness or modulus of a gas if it's an ideal gas, is just equal to its pressure. So if we wanted to calculate the modulus of the gas within this room, what is the modulus of the gas in this room? It's a tenth of an MPA, right? 101 kilopascals. And so it's a surprising result, but the modulus of a gas is just equal to its pressure. If somehow we close the doors and we double the pressure of the air in this room, it might hurt our ears because it would now be two atmospheres. The modulus of that would then be uh, equal to two atmospheres or 202 kPa. It may seem like an esoteric and useless calculation, but it turns out that the modulus of gas actually controls, as we'll talk about it yesterday, uh, t yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it yesterday, right? The velocity is equal to the modulus of the gas divided by its density, square root, as it turns out. So the seismic velocity, the acoustic velocity, the velocity at which you're hearing me speak, probably tired of me speaking by now, you could calculate if you know the modulus of gas, which you do, it's the pressure. We know what the pressure is. And if you know the density of gas. Anyone know what the density of air might be at atmospheric pressure? Order of magnitude? Yeah, one kilogram. You have to give units. One kilogram per cubic meter. So you could calculate the velocity of gas and you could tell me now that if you can count six seconds, then that's how long it takes for the lightning strike that you see a mile away for the sound to reach you. It's just the, the time taken, speed of sound ends up being about 600 miles an hour. And so you can do the, the math to do that. You should be able to calculate from that expression, but we'll talk about it uh, to, tomorrow in a in different context. Not tomorrow, on Friday. So that is a traditional, typical class. Any questions for you?